Yay! Hi there! So, it's a pleasure to, to speak here. Um, yeah, so I'm still waiting for the confirmation that I'm being streamed right now. Does it work? Everything is... Delight. Okay, I seem to be live. Great. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here um, and talking at the DVOC, so the digital uh, C3VOC. Um, and so I will be talking about Bluetooth random number generator, which is a topic I was working on together with Marta Dila, and he did it as a master thesis, and afterwards I continued it. Um, So, um, the question is always, um, how do things work, like in terms of uh, what does randomness look like? And I found this nice rabbit on the internet and it might give you some randomness. But uh, yeah, that's the big question. Is it really random what you get there or is it not random? Um, and uh, then Marta Dila asked me if he can do a master thesis with me. And back then when he started, I had something like 10 students and I was like, oh, you know, I have tons of students already working on Bluetooth and I don't really know what to give you because someone is like porting it to Linux, another person to macOS and so on. Uh, I don't really can paralyze more there. And then he was like, but I really want to do a master thesis with you. And then I was like, huh? Yeah, so I still, I still have this random number generator thing um, that someone really should look into. Um, and so, um, yeah, he started doing a master thesis with me. Um, now the big question is like, why is it even interesting to look in the random number generator? So um, if you look into the specification, the specification says that the random number generator really needs to be FIPS compliant because it is used for um, authentication, encryption, and everything else that's somewhat um, related to security. So um, that means that security breaks. <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm still confused with the mumble. I'm sorry. Uh, OK, so um, the, the random number generator is very important for security, for encryption, um, but also for um, authentication and everything that does security. And so it needs to be FIPS compliant, which means that it needs to pass certain statistical tests. And the specification also says like that you should replace the SHA-1 function by SHA-256 and so on, and proposes some tests that should be done with the random number generator. Um, now, the big thing is, even if a random number generator is passing statistical tests, it might still um, be broken. So just if it doesn't pass the test, then it's obviously broken. But even if it passes the test, there might still be something going on. So it might still not be cryptographically strong just because it's passing some tests. And now the big question is, in a Bluetooth chip, how can you acquire randomness? So there is multiple possibilities. Um, I don't know. So I, I asked my unicorn. So <laughs> and of course, my unicorn is here as always. Um, so and now the big question to the unicorn is, how do you acquire randomness? Um, so there might be, first of all, the answer to everything, which is uh, 42. Or then there is another thing that you might have heard about, which is um, the random access memory. And probably nobody heard about the um, random only memory. And then there is another option which sounds safe, which is the hardware random number generator. So that's a few options. Um, and still, so I didn't have the answer, my unicorn didn't have the answer, so I asked the internet joker, which is Twitter, and I made a poll um, so that everyone who knows InfoSec can um, check it out. And then I was looking for the answers. So what was the top answer? Yeah, 42 is the top answer. Um, but then some people also heard about hardware random number generators and some said random access memory and probably nobody ever heard about the random only memory. So let's see. Um, yeah, so how is it implemented actually? Um, so what, what um, Marta Dida looked into is uh, the following four devices. The first one is the Google Nexus 5, which is just like our 
let's say, hacking device in those terms. That is the first one where we got Nexmon and everything else working. Um, and then we have three more uh, devices listed here because we have symbols for them. So it's only partial symbols, just some function names and global variable names. But that's way more than just nothing because the Bluetooth firmware really doesn't have any strings. And within those four devices, he was already able to um, differentiate between two variants. Uh, the first one has an inline pseudorandom number generator, but also hardware number generator um, and no cache. And the second variant somehow has a cache and some little rewrite in the library so that the random number generator, uh, the pseudo random number generator is um, somehow outlined in, a, in another function. Um, so, and how does it look like? So the variant number two is just the code that's also in the variant number three for the hardware number generator. It just checks um, if the hardware random number generator is ready. And if it's ready, um, then it's basically just checking uh, if it has a new number. So it also pets the watchdog in between because just waiting for a new random number might take a moment so that the chip doesn't crash from this and then returns a four byte value with the, with the data. So that's it, very simple, just wait for the next random number. And it has also some constants just to check like if there is really a hardware random number generator present and if it has a new number and so on. But it's just magic numbers. Yeah, so um, that's, that's the basic setup. And then the pseudo random number generator is way more interesting because it's taking a few values. Um, so the values basically are the Bluetooth clock. The Bluetooth clock is a value that is shared for communication to all parties. Then there is the uh, local clock of the device. And then there's a few more values which have to do with signal processing. And it's taking all those values and putting them into the not so secure CRC32 functions um, just to compress it back to four bytes so that somehow the combined entropy of everything of this is combined back to the four bytes that we need for the um, random number uh, function. So it looks just the same no matter if the one or the other is called. Um, and so another input is the previous pseudo random number, but um, if it's initialized, then um, instead it's taking some memory. But that's that's basically the the only difference here. So this this one looks a bit strange. So really not the thing that you want to see, um, because like signal inputs might be predictable and clocks especially are predictable and CSC32 also does not look too good. Um, so what he did there was doing a few more measurements. <laughs> and so the measurements really didn't look good. The, the plots here are um, histograms and each histogram has just the values zero to 255, which means so the Bluetooth clock, for example, is actually four bytes. And then of course, one of the values is more frequent uh, because that's like one of the digits of the clock and so on. So it's not really a time plot here or something. He was just looking at the byte frequency. And the only thing that looks random is this plot H, the last one, which is the last random value. So if it would only use um, the pseudo random number generator, then this would be the entropy that the pseudo random number generator gets. Um, and then it was already the end of his thesis and we reported this. And what I currently do is I first uh, request a CVE at Mitra. They just take one or two days and then I send it to Broadcom and Cypress and their customers because um, this takes, so until Broadcom replies, it usually takes a week or longer. So, um, and they also don't issue any CVE. They don't issue any issue ID or something. So if I don't request a CVE in advance myself, then I cannot really track the issue. So that's, that's why we do it this way. It also confuses then the, the customers of Broadcom because they think Broadcom would assign those CVEs, but they don't. Um, yeah, so then we did responsible disclosure and um, we said, so yeah, so why would you introduce this pseudo random number generator, which really doesn't look good um, if you had a proper hardware 
random number generator. And then Broadcom said, like, why should we ever go to the pseudo-random fallback if we have the hardware in the device? So it was just like everyone claims, like, yeah, you did you did a mistake, but uh, nobody really said, like, and this is this is the mistake. So uh, it was just going forth and back. And Broadcom said, yeah, we we never ever go to the fallback, uh, so it's safe. And yeah, so this is then probably the end because Marta Dila's thesis was finished, so he handed it in. So no PRNG used in any of the devices he looked into. Um, nothing to see there. And then we just say goodbye, and <laughs> this is the end, so to say. Uh, the end in terms of um, yeah, um, everything everything is great and uh, everything is secure and nothing is bad. And now um, the cool thing here is that now um, my other student, former student Jan, will have a lot of time to explain all the weird machines and remote code execution to you, right? Because we are just like uh, 10 minutes or something in my talk. Um, but this is, this is only half the truth. So uh, this is not really the end. Because then, of course, um, I looked into a few more devices. Because some device, if they, if they have a fallback and even the code changed over time, then there should be a reason why they changed the code over time. And of course, you should also measure the hardware random generator itself. Um, so if it's really secure and the basic tests don't lead so much data, but if you take the diehard test suite, it means that you need to get one gigabyte of random data out of this chip over UART with some patches and it should be as fast as possible and so on and so forth. So this, this was really pain. Um, so <laughs> what did I do? First of all, you need to try to find a large free memory area um, in the chip while it's idle. And I found some on most chips, so it depends a bit. So different chips, different measurements, some of them had smaller regions. Um, and then I also wanted to be sure that no other process is writing into the memory area because actually the area is not really free. It's just currently not being used um, by uh, another process and hopefully not used by another process. So I was just using the fifth byte to write some test byte because the process usually writes like in a sequence and so on. So that's what I did a sanity check. And I also deactivated the original RBG run function so that they are that, that this is not called in the background um, and falsifies my results. And then the next thing is that I did some asynchronous callback so that I don't pull for data all the time, but I wait until the measurement is finished, uh, which makes it a bit faster. But so for this, you need to fix the land from and some HCI callback and stuff. And these were broken on a few devices. So it's somehow broken on the Nexus 6P and iPhone 7. And it's in another way broken on the Cypress evaluation boards. And yeah, well, they removed launch RAM on the iPhone 11. But so except from that, so on most devices, it, it, it works. Some devices need like certain patches. Uh, yeah, so and then finally, I had like some data from those chips and really like a gigabyte or more. And then I was like, okay, it's, it's just random data. I really don't care about it. So I just uploaded it to the, the Google Cloud because who cares? Um, and then it just locked me out and so on and so forth. But I could log in again, but it's like not what I usually do, like putting a lot of data uh, to Google. <laughs> and then Felix just said like, next time when I do this, I should maybe not call it random data.bin, but maybe encrypted backup.bin would be a funnier name. So. The reason, the reason why there is so much data for the Nexus 5 is probably because I put my backup in there. Um, yeah, so this is the data. Um, you see 2.7 gigabytes for the Nexus 5. That's where my encrypted backup is contained and all the others are the random numbers and all of them pass the die harder tests. Um, and then there is still some chips that are too much pain. So first of all, I have this uh, iMac late 2009, which basically has a 2007 firmware or something. And it's so slow and it has so little free memory that you really can forget to get data out of this chip. And then there is the Samsung Galaxy S10 and there they introduce stack canaries and stuff. So like it just gets more pain to write patches and the iPhone 11 currently is not supported by internal blue. So I need to 
write everything with blue tool by hand. So really like enter the hex numbers each and every one after the other. Um, but what I did for those devices is that I at least confirmed that there is a hardware random number generator and that when I do actions that triggered um, like pairing and stuff, that the number in the hardware random number generator is changing. So at least there is one present, but I didn't collect like one gigabyte or more of data. Um, yeah, so now the issue is, so there's tons of variants and the firmware itself, um, it's just a raw binary and that really makes it a lot of, a lot of pain because every mistake that you, that you get, um, when you try to find assembly and just find the wrong ARM instruction beginnings and so on and so forth, um, every mistake will make uh, an error in the call graph and then um, you will get wrong matches. So for um, IDA 68, the disassembler is a bit more aggressive and I think it's linear and then there is an IDA 7.2 and newer ones, it's doing it a bit different and then you have less false positives but it's also finding less and then there's amnesia which is also way too aggressive. So if you have too many um, like false positives, uh, you get problems if you don't find all of the functions. You also have problems. So it's, it's really, it's really pain. Um, and so I have a student who developed another tool that's not looking for this assembly, but just for raw binary stuff. And that's going to be released soon. But um, I also couldn't use this one there because if you have different compiler options and stuff, so if you go over a lot of year, years uh, in firmware versions, then this one also doesn't work that well. It works well for patches within the same chip and so on, but it doesn't work well for going over 10 years of firmware. Uh, yeah, so the variants. Um, the oldest variant is the one in the iMac and also the ASUS USB dongle. Um, and the pseudorandom number generator fallback um, looks very funny because it really just depends on a clock and the clock is incremented each 0 0.005 seconds by one and that's it. So um, the pseudo random number generator there is really, really, really bad, but also at least on the iMac late 2009, it's not being used. I currently didn't have an ASUS USB dongle to confirm, so I just looked into the firmware image. Um, yeah, so then there is tons of more chips of the variant two and three, which are the pseudo random number generator that I just showed to you. Um, still, what you can see here is that the location of the, the mapping of where this hardware register is uh, changed. Um, and so it changed a bit over the years, but then forth and back. So the, the chip date, the compile date is not always necessarily exactly what the memory mapping is and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, then there is variant number five and variant number five is the one that you can find in the current um, iPhone 11, but also the iPhone 8 XXR. I don't have a film dump of the chip of the iPhone XS, it's a different one. Um, and then also the Samsung Galaxy S10, S20, um, they all have this new variant. And the new variant is a rewrite of this complete uh, random byte generator library. So it's a, everything is different inside and it has some kind of asynchronous cache and so on. Um, but uh, it's still using this uh, library in the same way. So it's still using the same calls that I will sh show you later in a call graph. And what they did is they removed the pseudo random number generator, at least from what I could see. I mean, it's always hard to say because um, there's also like patches and a lot of other stuff. So I could still be missing something in a firmware without any symbols and so on and so forth. But it looks like they, they skipped the pseudo random number generator, which means if in one of those uh, firmware versions, um, the hardware random number generator would be wrong in some way, then there wouldn't be any fallback, which might also not be good. Yeah, and then there is uh, the variant number four, because I, I can count, I just skipped variant number four, and the variant number four, yeah, somehow they forgot the hardware random number generator. So one of all those devices that I looked into was actually missing it. And it's obviously the number four, because, uh, yeah, it's probably a bit like the Debian random number generator, which is also returning four all the time. 
So, um, and now if you look into that device that is missing um, the hardware random number generator, we have the same pattern as in the variant number two. So um, we have the previous random value, we have two clocks and we have some um, signal based inputs. Um, so now the first one, the clock, um, you can see, so this is a measurement really over uh, 50 minutes, just looking into the Bluetooth clock and the hardware clock, and the hardware clock starts at FF, 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 and then the Bluetooth clock increases. The Bluetooth clock itself is shared over the air, um, but it might be reset, so they might not, so they correlate, but they might not have like a corresponding value. So you still, as an attacker, would need to figure out what the current local um, hardware clock of the device is. Um, but you might also be able, as an attacker, to set this. So if you crash the, the Bluetooth chip, um, then it starts again at FF, 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 which means um, that now crash only attacks, which Broadcom is usually not patching, become relevant again. And this is, this is really sad. So it means a very simple um, crash only attack in whatever state machine entering some weird state or whatever that is no memory bug, um, but crashes the chip can already be relevant um, to reset this. Um, yeah, and now there is signal processing inputs. So there is a resistor called DC FH out. And on the left hand side, you can see it's um, getting just values between 1 and 80, something around this. And on the right hand side, you can see that also um, over time, it's not really random, but you can see a pattern. So it stays a bit of the time the same. And then it, the numbers that follow each other are somewhat similar. Um, so it's also not really the best random input there. And then there is two more that are a bit random. The first one is the Rx init angle, um, which only takes a few values if you measure over time. And the second one um, is the HEC status. I think it's somewhat like RSSI, but um, so in the first measurement, it was really zero all the time. In the second measurement, it was sometimes zero, sometimes getting values, but also just values in the same range. Um, so it's again, not really random which altogether means that if those inputs are not random and an attacker um, gets the current value of the RNG, um, the attacker might be able to predict the next values of the RNG. Now the question is, so why did we even stop after like looking into 17 chips? So 17 is the most random number between one and 20. You can, you can look that up on the internet. There's multiple studies that confirm 17 is the most random number. So I didn't measure more devices than 17. And also that was um, one of the mottos for um, the Easter hack um, some years ago in Frankfurt. So just 17 is the most random one. That's why. Mm, and then something funny happened because um, Broadcom's customer who, who had this issue with the missing uh, hardware random number generator got a bit nervous. And so they asked, like, can we tell Qualcomm? Because um, like maybe somewhere else there's also um, randomness missing. And then I said, well, I mean, you can tell them, but at least we don't have any NDA or something. So they wouldn't tell us. And why should they tell you if they are insecure? So it really doesn't make that much sense, but of course you can ask like if this black box of magic of random number generator for Qualcomm chips is uh, is like broken and then they asked and then they gave us some answer and this answer I'm not allowed to show you here and then I they gave me another answer and that's the answer that I'm allowed to show you here, which is, uh, yeah, they didn't found any indicators um, that that they have the same issue in uh, a pseudo random number generator or something. So they say, we think our random numbers are secure, um, but that's again a thing. So you, you would never ever know for a Bluetooth chip until you do this whole reverse engineering and all those measurements, if it is really secure. Um, now the impact. So I said um, in all versions, so or variants, so variant one to uh, five, the uh, function RBG rand is called the same way. Um, and that means that there is one variant where it's put into a wrapper. So this SHA get one to eight byte rand. 
uh, a bit rent. So this one is a 16 byte uh, output and it's just taking 16 times the IBG rent function and putting it into the SHA function. But it's just in, in a loop, so that means that there is not that much randomness. So for the timers and so on, um, you can predict how they change. Um, and then also those, those values um, that come from the signals, they very similar over time. So probably it's just the same value over the whole round. Um, and then there's the other variant. So the red one above, which is ULP rand, this is ultra low power and is used for everything that's Bluetooth LE. And for those, they are just copying those four bytes as they are uh, without any SHA on top. Um, and you get the direct state of the previous random value. And this is, for example, used in the um, Secure Manager ULP function to, uh, to send an initialization vector. And this one is just sent in plain text over the air before encryption starts, for example. So this state definitely leaks. Um, yeah, so um, random numbers are needed, for example, in the numeric comparison protocol. That's a protocol when you pair two devices and get a six-digit uh, number shown on those devices. And this protocol prevents active man in the middle attacks by making a commitment on a random number um, and then later opening this commitment. So a commitment is just something I, I give you a key for a safe and I tell you in the safe is something and uh, Later, I give you, uh, uh, the other way around, I give you the, the safe, whatever. But it's basically, I'm committing to something without telling you the what. And then later, I open it. And this property breaks as soon as you can predict the random number. Um, so the numeric comparison for the man in the middle attack um, is now vulnerable in that sense. Um, yeah, and there is also a few other things that break. But this is just an example. So you can no longer do the pairing with the six-digit number without being uh, secure against man in the middle attacks. And then I looked into Android. And Android, uh, well, they, they had a good idea. So overall, so if the Bluetooth chip is um, FIPS compliant, it means, um, sorry, so if the if the um, chip is so if the RNG is uh, FIPS compliant, it means that the Bluetooth chip on an Android device is a safe uh, source of randomness in that sense. So it's really good to take this one because it's certified and Android runs on very many, 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 many devices, and you never know if in a cheap whatsoever uh, China phone you would have um, a good RNG, and it's a good idea to take the Bluetooth random. Uh, yeah, so that's why they do this, I think. And what you can see in this Wireshark trace is that the LE run function, which directly calls the ULP run, which directly calls the RBG run, is called multiple times in a row. And the first four calls are actually used to create um, an elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman private key and then later compute a public key. And the second one is uh, then sent over the air. Um, and you can also look this up in the in the current Android code, and this of course means that well, if you if you have um, a RNG that is broken, then the the private keys directly initialize with, with this one, and so it's uh, just leaking the key without even any active man in the middle. So it's just a passive man in the middle that somehow can infer from the other numbers that are sent over the air what what was the previous state of the RNG is now able to. No, the key just passive. Now the question is, so when will there be a patch? So the device uh, with the missing hardware random number generator, um, I, I skipped the name of the device on purpose uh, because this one didn't um, pass the 90 day deadline yet because we found this one a bit later. Um, but um, the problem is that also Broadcom and their customer, they cannot provide us with um, the patch in advance. So they don't even give us the binary or something. And they also don't tell us when exactly it will be patched. So all I do is I go like to, to vendor websites and check like, <laughs> is there any update announced? And once there is the CVE that I initially um, got from, from Mitra, if this one is listed there, then I can hope for like, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, reverse engineering that patch and if it's not mentioned then usually it means that there is no patch so i don't know for the for the first issue that that was really serious that we found i started like um 
reverse engineering each monthly patch and then like so I did it for three months and it didn't happen until in the fourth month it, it, it was happening and then it was already officially announced um, and as there is currently no patch announced um, they will definitely not make the 90 day deadline and I also think like even if giving them two more weeks it, it really will not make the deadline so um, yeah let's let's see how that develops but I think there will not be any good patch in time So, um, the lessons learned, don't trust any embedded random number generator. Uh, it might just be a bad pseudo-random number generator that still was passing some statistical tests. Um, but once you know the, the inputs of, of such a pseudo-random number generator, uh, you might see that it's insecure. So, yeah, you never, you never know. Um, and then also during all this patching, I, I really saw like how the firmware evolved over more than 10 years and how each of them has like their individual bugs that you need to fix to interact with it and to get like one gigabyte out of data out of that chip and so on and so forth. So that was definitely interesting uh, for this project. And now I need to uh, give some credits, first of all, to Marta Dila for surviving a thesis with me and um, also Felix who helps me with everything that's crypto and that I don't understand. Then there is uh, Matthias, my boss, uh, who makes it possible to buy like one smartphone and another smartphone and I don't know, and another smartphone and still another smartphone. And then there is Jacob who made it possible for me to access one of the devices that I needed um, remote in a setup so he's also in the next month team and then I had two proofreaders for the paper that I wrote in parallel um, who also helped me a lot like last minute that's that's always the thing because papers always get done last minute um, so that's it uh, for my talk and now you can ask questions um, there's also a pad where you can put in your questions um, and then I will answer them. So let's see. A oh, full screen from my Nakama. Oh, wait a second. Yep. Um, <laughs> so do you see me full screen on my camera now? I hope so. I hope so. Okay. Um, so the questions. Um, the first, the first. What? Yeah, 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 yeah. You can only hear me in the live stream. That's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm already in the question pad. So I, I just answered the question from the pad. Okay. I can, yeah, so I can hear uh, everyone speaking the mumble. It's just that people cannot hear me speaking the mumble, but I can hear you. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. So I, I just I just read the questions myself and answer the questions myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's easier if I, if I just do it on my own. I'm sorry. Um, so the the first question is if we are able to access the main CPU from an exploit in the Bluetooth chip. So that <laughs> that depends. So it's it's a complicated question which I which I cannot fully answer yet. But. Um, so, okay, so I'm going on on my own. So anyway, so there is, uh, so people are asking if there is an exploit to um, escalate into the operating system. Um, and so the first thing is that there is like a lot of drivers and I would say the most interesting one is um, since the iPhone XS and iPhone 11, they are attaching the Bluetooth chip via PCI Express. But except from that, I'm not, um, uh, commenting anymore. Uh, yeah, so 
Then uh, people are asking entropy. Yeah, so I mean, it's not really random. There's the timer, which is not random. And then there is like um, two more inputs that are like one byte or something, but not even the full byte being used. So I don't know, there might be um, like one byte or something that you need to brute force. Um, uh, yeah, so next question. How did we access the Bluetooth chip on the iPhones? Um, yeah, jailbreaks. So um, internal blue is working well on everything. Like, I don't know, I also have this this uh, cute iPhone uh, 6 here. Um, so on iPhone uh, 6, on iOS 12, but also iOS 13, everything that's an UI chip, um, it's working with internal blue, but you need to jailbreak. But uh, yeah, Checkmate does a great job and then you can just install it. Um, yeah, so, and, um, no, 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 internal blue, internal blue. <laughs> Someone is, ah, uh, can I, I cannot edit the pad, but internal blue. Um, and then, um, it doesn't have anything to do with the RKI app for the COVID-19 tracking. No, 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 it's nothing. Um, we don't have any working expert right now. I mean, that, that would be cool, like, I don't know, building something to calculate it back, yeah. Um, but then again, um, currently publishing exploit is so, so because it's not being fixed in time. So uh, yeah, I mean, we, we probably should build it. Uh, shouldn't be too high uh, based on the measurements. Um, uh, yeah, so then there is the next question. So how much uh, money would vendors save by not including uh, a good uh, hardware ING? I mean, they just need to include a good pseudo random number generator actually. So uh, that's everything that the Bluetooth specification requires. Um, and I'm, I'm not even sure like, um, so for me, for me, the firmware, but I don't know, it, it might just be that for the smartphone where it's missing, that they already put it in there, uh, but didn't really wire it or something, or for example, that um, the chip already went into production, but I don't think that they initially leave it out to save some money. Um, yeah, so next question. Um, so how can we make more accurate statistical tests? I mean, die harder um, and so on. They already have accurate statistical tests. Um, the problem is just that if you have like some pseudo random number generator and don't know the inputs, then it will look very random despite the input itself was not random. Um, yeah, so the paper, we just submitted it to a conference. Um, we might, so the conference doesn't prevent us from, from uh, publishing on archive or something, um, but it includes the model of the vulnerable smartphone. So we can, earliest we can do it would be, I think, first of May or something. So um, yeah. The next comment is uh, great work. And what does my unicorn think about all the stuff? I don't know. So yeah, unicorn uh, on the stream again, saying hello. <laughs> um, yeah, next question. Um, if um, so how they, how they could fix the pseudo random number generator using the other sources than they had. I, I really, I really don't know. And that's the thing. So that's why I asked them, like, how are you going to fix this? And they just said, like, we are going to fix it in time. And this is, this is really an issue, the whole, the whole patching policy there. Um, so it's really annoying because <laughs> I, I don't know how it, how it will be fixed and when it will be fixed. Uh, so I have no idea. Um, and now, yeah, can I quickly explain what random only memory is? So this is um, basically just a joke that Jan um, is going to, to make in a, <laughs> so he's going to, to make the next talk. So, and so I was like, you know, they don't have a hardware random number generator. What do you think where they will like get the randomness from when they patch it? And then I was like, I don't know, yeah, so maybe random access memory. And then just for fun, we said like, oh, maybe there's, there's also a random only memory like ROM, but ROM obviously is not random only memory, but it's just like, where the hell should they get the sources from to make a good uh, patch for this? 
Uh, yeah, so why is there no SPF record for Bluetooth.lol? Uh, this, this, the Bluetooth.lol domain, I don't know. So for some legacy reasons, I, I still have some website hosted at one and one, or I don't know, it's now United Internet or IONOS, I don't know what. I just, I just clicked it there and there is nothing properly configured on it. I'm sorry. Um, and then last question, why does the unicorn wear an antenna on its head? Yeah, so that's, that's a controversial thing. Like if tinfoil hats actually uh, help you to um, get less radiation or if they increase uh, radiation. Uh, yeah, so I don't know, but I mean, I, it looks at least stylish, I guess. Um, so <laughs> enjoy it. Enjoy the, the hat. Um, yeah, so I don't know. So now you can probably see it better. That's that's the awesome tinfoil hat that my friends made for my unicorn when it graduated. Um, okay, so I think that's the questions already. Uh, yeah, cool. No more questions, I guess, except from if I hear something in the mumble but looks all right um so we can probably hand over to Jan <laughs>